This is Dan Schneider, and on this edition of the Dan Schneider Video Interview, I will be talking about the life and career of Rod Serling with his daughter, Ann Serling, and two experts on the man's life and career, Mark Olshaker and Mark DeWidziak, and we will be doing that in just a moment. All right, well, let's begin this show, and uh, I'll introduce the p three panelists again. Uh, you will see Ann Serling. She's the daughter of Rod Serling, and she wrote a book some years ago about her father, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then there are two men, Mark Olshaker and Mark DeWidziak, who are also experts on the life and career of Rod Serling. So let me uh, just uh, open up with Ann. Uh, if you could just tell a little bit about yourself and uh, your father and uh, what you've uh, been doing uh, in the years since his death and, uh, uh, you know, in, in promoting his legacy. Uh, hi, Dan. I, I was an early childhood teacher, and but I've always been interested in writing. And I wrote my memoir as I knew him, my dad, Rod Serling, in 2013. The paperback version came out. Uh, the, in 2014, uh, it, I had originally started another book after my dad died called In His Absence because I was trying to navigate that whole minefield of grief, uh, but I couldn't complete that book because I was still quite distraught. Uh, so this book, as I knew him, took about six or seven years to write, and um, I'm currently working on a novel called Aftershocks. Um uh, were you uh, an only child, uh, or, or do you have uh, siblings as well? I have an older sister. And uh, did you grow up in Hollywood, because your father was quite well known back uh, in the day? Uh, I was born in Greenwich, Connecticut, and we moved to California when I was about uh, three years old, as live television died, uh, all, and, you know, they said all the writers moved west. So we lived in Pacific Palisades, which is about 20 minutes west of Los Angeles. Okay. Let me move on to Mark Olshaker. Mark, uh, if you could uh, tell me a little bit about your background in general uh, in regards to television or the writing industry, and also specifically related to Rod Serling and how you know Ann. Uh, sure. Um, I am a professional writer and television producer. I do books, both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, we're working on the 15th uh, published book right now, and uh, I've done many documentary films, mostly for PBS. And uh, one of the reasons I'm a professional writer today is because of Rod Serling, who in my teen years I idolized uh, along with The Twilight Zone and got to meet him when I was 14. And uh, because of his personality and his generosity and the kind of wonderful guy he was, we became friends. And so I knew him and looked up to him and considered him a mentor for what became the last 10 years of his life. Uh, and I do believe that I am the kind of writer that I am today, uh, both in fiction and nonfiction, because of him. Uh, what sorts of documentaries do you do? Things for like Frontline or American Masses, American Experience? Not, fr not Frontline, but uh, Nova, which is also up at WGBH. I've uh, done a number of shows on all kinds of different topics, uh, science, crime. Uh, I spend most of my time now uh, working on true crime. I've written a series of books beginning with Mindhunter, uh, with the FBI's behavioral profiling pioneer, John Douglas that have sold very well, and I'm currently working on a book on the other subject, which I seem to specialize in, public health. We're writing a, I'm writing a book with a very prominent epidemiologist about uh, what the infectious disease world is going to be like uh, post Ebola, and that's actually as scary as anything that we've seen on the Twilight Zone. Uh, and as far as how I met Anne, it was uh, almost Twilight Zone-like. Uh, I went up to a conference and uh, introduced myself, uh, or Ron Serling conference at Ithaca College uh, in uh, Ithaca, New York. I introduced myself to Anne. She thought she knew my name, and uh, Anne can tell the story after that. And we just, again, became uh, fast friends very, very closely. Uh, she's like a sister to me now. And 
um, there's something about the Serling family that just connects. Ah, okay. Uh, one of these days I plan on doing an interview show on documentary makers. Uh, I'll, I'll see if you can want to sit in on that one as well. Sure. I, I had actually done a written interview with a fellow named John Grabowski. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a nature documentarian who's done some PBS documentaries. But Mark Dewitziak, uh let's get a little background about you and your relationship to the other Mark as well as Anne uh, Serling and your interest in uh, her father's uh, work and legacy. Well, I, I've uh, been a theater, film, TV critic for about 38 years. So uh, the work of Rod Serling, I'll echo what Mark said. Um, I'm a writer today probably because of two writers, um, Mark Twain and Rod Serling. Um, Mark Twain, can you tell? Um, <laughs> so it, it, I, I came under the influence of The Twilight Zone uh, as a young man. And as with Mark Twain, I got to know more about the man when I was in high school. And as I learned more and more about the man, you got to learn that in addition to this great writing, which is what really initially draws you in, uh, both with Mark Twain and Rod Serling, but then you read about their lives and you realize these were heroic individuals. And um, I've said this before, you know, but this was the first time I got the idea that a writer could be heroic. Yeah. Um, and I, I happen to think that the life of Rod Serling, like the life of Mark Twain, is in many ways <clears throat> heroic. And um, so I, I, they, they became uh, heroes, role models uh, for me. And I, I don't think it's any understatement to say I'm a writer today uh, because of these two very American writers. Um, I've written about 15 books, and the next one is going to be on The Twilight Zone, the one I'm working on right now which Anne knows about because she's going to write it forward for it, um, is on the Twilight Zone. And I've always felt that this was the book I was owed. Um, when I was first starting casting about to write a book uh, in the early 1980s, I wanted to write a history of the Twilight Zone. Mm. And uh, Mark Scott Sacre beat me to it. And oh, I've heard the name of it, yeah. It couldn't even be all <clears throat> that angry about it. Excuse me. <clears throat> all that angry about it because he did such a pioneering job on that book that um, I had to set my sights on another book. So I wrote a history of the Columbo series uh, instead. Yeah. And but my goal in writing that book was to write a book as good about Columbo as he had written about the Twilight Zone. And I've written several other books of film history. I've written fiction, nonfiction, plays, um, a little bit of everything. If I could stick to one thing, I'd be successful, basically. <laughs> Well, we'll get to, to, to Rod Serling's importance in a, a little bit in terms of television writing, but I, I, obviously he's up, up there as considered maybe one of the founding fathers of uh, screenwriting along with Patty Shayesky. And uh, this is the third straight week that I'm doing a show on uh, American uh, artists. I had done one on Eugene O'Neill and then last week on Stanley Kubrick. And certainly I think in the medium of television, Serling is as important to early television as O'Neill is uh, to modernism in American theater or Kubrick is uh, to American film. So anyway, Absolutely. yeah, Question. so um, let's, let's actually talk, uh, not, let's talk in more general terms just for the, the uninitiated because a lot of people who will be seeing this on YouTube or any other venues, you know, uh, Rod Serling died 40 years ago. I don't know if it's 40 years to the day or whatnot, but uh, in 1975. So there's going to be a couple of generations that grew up that have only seen maybe some old Twilight Zones, uh, maybe have uh, uh, seen the old Twilight Zone magazine. Um, uh, if Ann or, or one of you want to just step in and just give a sort of brief overview for two or three minutes uh, of the man uh, and his import. We'll get into a little bit more detail uh, in our next segment of his, his actual life and uh, World War II and that kind of thing. But uh, if one of you could tell me just about really the, the impact that the Serling had on the fledgling medium, especially of uh, screenwriting for television. I think Mark ought to start with that and then we'll jump in. Okay, Mark. Sure. Um, you know, first off, you have to understand the time. The fact that uh, television in the 1950s was the Wild West. Uh, it was a, a wide open medium. All things were possible. And they were doing things with very little resources. And the word had gone out for most of the Hollywood studios, do not have anything to do with this new medium. Uh, your contract will be torn up. Uh, so they had to make their own stars. Television as a new medium uh, couldn't rely on established stars. They were being told, don't do television. 
And one of the things they did, very smartly, was to create stars out of the writers. Yeah. Uh, you would actually see introductions saying, this week, a new drama by Patty Shiesky. This week, a new drama by Rod Serling. And people look forward to that. I mean, how much could you even do that today? Can you imagine that today? Somebody saying, you know, the, a new drama. Who cares? Who cares? Let me, who, add, oh, let me add something to that, Mark. Uh, Tan Mosell, who was another one of the original generation, once said to me that uh, he heard uh, that kind of uh, announcement going out and it said, and uh, in two weeks, a new drama by Tad Mosell. And Tad looked at the screen and said, if I finish it. So right. it, it was literally that immediate. And uh, Mark, I think you could, you could probably speak to this, that this was really, and I, I really became aware of this when I was writing the uh, introduction to the new uh, publication of, through Bob Serling Books, of Requiem for a Heavyweight, that uh, this really was a hybrid between movies and stage, uh, with some taken from both, uh, but it really was, they called them teleplays for a reason. It had the energy of live theater, because they were pretty much doing it live, and it had the, the grit, the emotional and intellectual grit of the theater as well. And... But it was something unto itself. Yes. That's the amazing thing about the live drama. And if you go back and you look at the, the, this moment where it arrives, it really solidifies television as a new medium. It justifies it. It, it shows that this is a legitimate form. And it is not quite theater. And it is not quite movies. Right. But it's something unto itself. Walter Kerr wrote an essay because... Um, Walter Kerr was a man of the theater, and he loved classic movies. And he said he was late coming to television because he looked down on the medium. And people said, no, 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 you have got to see some of these live dramas that are being done. And finally he saw one, and he wrote an essay. It's an amazing essay, and he said, this is how I knew this was a legitimate new medium, because I realized that if you missed it, you could not make up this experience anywhere else on the cultural landscape. When you can say that, you have a legitimate art form. And he realized television had come of age. And the two principal practitioners who brought it of age were Patty Shiesky and Rod Serling. Yeah, and, and it should, it should be noted, Mark, let me just say, uh, that Rod Serling, uh, more so than Patty Shiesky, uh, was all over television, even before the, the yeah, Twilight Zone, I think. I think, I, I think he did uh, I think he did guest shots on Jack Benny. I think he did a guest shot on one of the Lucy series, Lucille Ball series, if I, you know, as, as a guest. So, I mean, this was a, a writer that was uh, one of the, you know, most, uh, I guess you call Q rating, had the, one of the high Q rating kind of things uh, that uh, you're not going to see today. I made that point in the introduction to, to Patterns, the reprint of the... the, the four screenplays, Rod's first book, which uh, Rod Serling Books reprinted. And I, I made that exact point, which was Rod Serling, because of television, was something which is very, very rare for a writer. He was a celebrity. He was a, a, a 40 carat celebrity, meaning you could show Rod Serling's face to people on the planet, and they would know who it was. They would recognize him. Nobody recognizes writers. Yeah. I mean, maybe today Stephen King or somebody like that. But, you know, a writer can walk down the street and be anonymous. And in American literature, we're going to go back to Mark Twain for a second. The only two writers who were genuine celebrities, meaning they were recognized on the planet, around the planet, were Mark Twain and Rod Serling. Mm -hmm. They were conspicuous Americans. I think and, that's very true. And... Uh... Anne has often said that she and her sister used to resent when the public would take over uh, their father from her. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, the, the reason my, my dad was actually not going to be the one that would be introducing the Twilight Zone. It was somebody else whose name I can't remember. And then they wanted Orson Welles, uh, who proved to be too expensive, so my dad volunteered. But that's, I, you know, that was the celebrity status. That's why he 
you know, became so well known because he did become the announcer. But to what you said, Mark, you know, sometimes we did resent it because people would come up to him and know who he was. But as I wrote in my book, the paparazzi, you know, years ago was nothing like it is today. It wasn't in your face, rude, uh, offensive. But my dad was always extremely gracious to his fans and anyone that wanted to talk to him. And they remember that. People have said that to me today, how kind he was and how he stopped and, and he took the time to talk to them. Well, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was just looking at your face, Anne, when you were listening to the two marks. I, I, there's a f famous photo of your father sort of looking off to the left and you had that exact same look. I could, I could, I could, I could, I could see the resemblance. Um, uh -huh. Well, let's uh, end this segment. When we get back, let's uh, delve a bit more into Rod Serling's early life. Uh, his youth, uh, his stint in World War II, and how that affected him and his rise uh, in the 1950s into the television medium. And we will continue in a moment. All right, we're back, and we're going to talk now a little bit more in depth about the early life of Rod Serling. And your father's name was actually Rodman, which is... Uh, uh, now sort of been co-opted by the former basketball player Dennis Rodman. When that, when I ever I hear that, but uh, it's an it's an unusual uh, name. You'd think it would be Rodney, with shorter for Rod. But uh, there was a famous, I think, in 1959, right before the Twilight Zone. There was a famous interview your father did with Mike Wallace, where I think he describes himself as this scrawny little Jew from upstate New York or whatnot. And uh, uh, it, it's one of the more, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's one of the more extraordinary and in-depth interviews that, that can be seen because your father is really scathing about the medium that, that gave him fame. But as I said, we'll talk about the specifics of that later. Let, let's just talk a, a little bit about your father, uh, his, his youth, his family life, uh, any siblings, and you know the first 15 or so years before he did go off into World War II, if you can, Anne. Sure. My dad was born in Syracuse, New York, and he moved to Binghamton when he was about two years old. His dad worked for his father-in-law um, in the meat market and was a butcher. My father would have described his childhood as very idyllic. The episode Walking Distance is certainly autobiographical. From the Twilight Zone, just so people know. That. Yes. Yeah. Yes, um, of course. When he went off to war, that you know that changed. When he, when he was in the war, his his father died at fifty two, and even though the war was over, my dad didn't have enough points to go home, and uh, for the funeral. Yeah. So that was another trauma on top of the war. But um, again, his childhood, growing up in Binghamton, small town. Uh, he, every summer, actually, when. We have a cottage here in upstate New York, and every summer my dad would drive back to Binghamton and drive by his old house. It was an annual pilgrimage that he would take. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because some of the most affecting writing your father did, both for Twilight Zone afterwards and in the teleplays, generally evolve, I think, around three topics. Those involving price fighters, those involving people looking to get back to an earlier, simpler time, and uh, those involving World War II or war in general, those seem to be the, the sort of three touchstone issues that some of the best episodes of, of the shows and some of the best live plays uh, dealt with. Um, uh, Mark, e either Mark, if you want to comment anything about uh, Rod Serling's youth. Yeah, I would, I would say what Ann said is absolutely true. Uh, one time several years ago, uh, Ann and her husband Doug and uh, I and my wife Carolyn we went back to Binghamton, went back to Rod's old house, traced the area where he would have lived, hung out, ridden his bicycle into uh, the park where there is a carousel. And it really was like walking distance, wouldn't you say, Anne? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, he did have uh, an idyllic childhood, or at least by his perception. And uh, that all changed uh, with the advent of World War II. And, uh, I would say both his childhood and his experience in war uh, became hallmarks, as you say, and uh, and uh, stayed with him both personally, spiritually, and in terms of his material for the rest of his life. He told a writing class, actually, that he had a propensity to write about nostalgic themes. And, um, of course, boxing was something that he did uh, to earn money before he went off to the Philippines. Oh, he was actually involved in boxing before the war. Yes. Um, 
uh, Molly. God's nose broke. <laughs> it's it, 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 um, yeah, and I would add one thing to that. One is that, you know, we, we keep saying he was in the war. Um, there's no way to overstate that. He, he was a paratrooper in the, in the South Pacific, which is, uh, you know, as hellish an assignment as somebody could have. Um, the war is such a profound <clears throat> uh, influence uh, on him that later on, when he becomes an, <clears throat> an anti-war uh, a very outspoken, anti -war, eloquent voice for anti-war sentiments. It's based on up-close and personal experience, which can't be in any way diminished because of where he was, what he experienced, and what he saw. Um, and I would add one other thing about uh, what Rod wrote about. Um, there is another area that's very, very equally as important as the three that have already been mentioned, is that Rod Serling, a lot of Rod Serling's writing is about age, and people facing moral decisions at certain points of their age. And you can go through his entire career, starting with patterns, which right. is about that, which is about, you know, when do we throw people away? When do we throw experience away? And the and same thing with Requiem for a Heavyweight. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Walking Distance, mm -hmm. same thing with Last Stop at Willoughby, all the way into the Night Gallery when he's, the, 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 they're tearing down Tim Riley's bar. This is a, a theme he goes back to, and he keeps, I think he would have kept examining that theme throughout his entire life. If, 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 he'd, if he'd lived to be 75, he would have still been looking at that, re-examining those themes which were introduced in patterns. And I can uh, tell even in his later years, which were his mid to late 40s, he was already looking back on things and how he missed the old days, and by our standard today, he was a very young man at that point. Yeah. Yeah. His, his own father died when he was 52, so there, you know, he may have been thinking that, you know, there was a genetic predisposition, too. To... Was uh, Rod Serling, uh, we, you said he's outspoken politically within his work, was he someone who took up causes? Did he march in, like, Selma, Alabama, or anything like that, with the civil rights marches, or... He was extremely outspoken and, uh, and, and absolutely fearless. Uh, prejudice was the greatest evil in the world as far as he was concerned. And when Anne was uh, writing her book, I introduced her to a man who unfortunately has passed away named uh, Mike Newman, who was a classmate of Rod's at Antioch. And Mike told us a story that neither one of us, I think, had heard, Anne, uh, that there were two barber shops in town. And this would have been in the late 1940s two barber shops in uh, uh, Antioch uh, College in Ohio. And uh, one of them refused to cut the hair of black people. And Rod absolutely railed against this. And he would not let anybody he knew at the university go to this barber shop. Hmm. So that's just an early example of, uh, of what became uh, a lifelong hallmark. And I have to underscore and agree with uh, Mark Davidziak said, which is that he was heroic in this. Where did uh, where did the, his sense of uh, outrage of this thing come from? Was it based in religion? Was he a religious person, or was it something that political views that developed early in his youth? Was his family like ultra liberal, or was it just something that you know the, the war influenced these uh, these opinions? Where 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 did that part of his uh, worldview come from? Does anyone know? I think he was inherited in his makeup, man, don't you? Well, his own father told him that, that he, he didn't feel that he was a very good Jew, but that he was a good man, and that he didn't think it mattered where, where somebody went to go and pray, as, as long as they were a good person. And I think that you know, really became a, a part of my dad's makeup, too. Um, although my father was fiercely proud of his Jewish heritage, actually his first dose of prejudice came from his own people when he was blackballed from a Jewish fraternity for dating non-Jewish girls. Mm. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to now post-war. Uh, how, how did uh, Rod Serling's writing career begin? Uh, did, he, did he do the, the very early television shows, even before playwrights? Did he write for any, like, you know, Sid Caesar show? Did he, uh, uh, you know, how did he get his entree into things? Well, one word, Cincinnati. Um, the, the training ground for Rod after he, he got out of college um, 
was really this kind of um, you, it's it's like a stand-up comedian. They always used to say you have to have some place where you can go and be bad. You have to have to go to some place where you can go and 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 and. and be able to try your wings out and fail and see what works for you and work things right, develop your style. And I think for Rod, the, the, the baptism by fire was when he went to work at a station in Cincinnati. And, they, and in those days, local stations did uh, live dramas, original dramas. They did all sorts of things. And Rod really got a chance to write a lot during that period. That's a period that's not as studied, uh, as concentrated on as other periods of his life. But uh, you've got to start the whole thing in Cincinnati because I think without Cincinnati, you don't get to the next step. You don't get Rod Serlin because this is the door. He takes all his experiences growing up in Binghamton, the war experiences, the college experiences. He packs his bags and he goes to Cincinnati. And Cincinnati is kind of the door that leads to the live dramas of the 1950s. And do you agree with that? Yes, I do. I, I also... Um... A little bit to that, I think it's interesting that when my dad got out of the war, he was going to major in phys ed because he liked working with kids. He was going to teach phys ed, but uh, he was so traumatized by the war, that's when he switched to language and literature and, and, and uh, the writing. But, but in the radio days, he would, um, he would be the writer, the actor, and the producer of those radio scripts, so... So he wasn't he wasn't the stereotypical guy after the war like a, a Norman Mailer trying to write the great American novel. He plunged headfirst into this newer media. Mailer in a lot of ways. Uh, he came out of the war very affected by that. There are uh, uh, interesting. You mentioned Norman Mailer because he was the other writer who uh, I became uh, quite friendly with. Uh, both, interestingly enough, uh, New York uh, Jews of Lithuanian descent, both ended up fighting in the Philippines uh, as enlisted men in the war, and both became, in a way, uh, touchstones of the 50s and 60s generation, a generation which um, I think we can say believed, uh, was idealistic enough to believe that anything was possible and cynical enough to believe that nothing was true. And I think uh, that a lot of that came from uh, our grounding in the Twilight Zone. So uh, in the early 50s, there's a lot of these live programs going on, 60 to 90 minutes. Um, how long did uh, Serling have to, you know, send around scripts to, you know, to get produced? Because there was probably, uh, from what I've read, you know, maybe uh, between 600 to 800 hours worth of live drama going on yearly with the then three networks with CBS, NBC, and Dumont. I don't think ABC was considered a network at that time. Uh, uh, so how, how long <laughs> first uh, uh, actual produced teleplay of his? Well, I, I know, I'll let you guys speak to that, but I know that he had 40 rejections before he was finally accepted. In fact, someone told him that he ought to switch professions because he'll never become a writer. Mark, it was really the Dr. Christian contest that put him on the map, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. That was the one that sort of brought it to the attention of the, the New York uh, uh, set. That, that's, that before that, he was basically a, a regional writer, a Cincinnati writer. And even there, um, what, what really gets things going is, I, I'd, always, I'd always like this, is that, you know, the, the, the thing that really puts Rod on the map is patterns. I mean, you know, before patterns... You know, Rod is is he's struggling. He's he's trying to he's writing scripts. He's selling scripts. It's a it's a week to week experience uh, uh, as far as his livelihood is concerned. Patterns and, and there's just no way to sort of talk about this kind of rocket like moment of arrival when when patterns airs. You can almost see collectively, you know, the the, the, the the hair rising on the back of everybody's neck. Like, what in the world is this? And what was the date on that, Mark? Now you're going to ask that. I'm going to have because you think that would be, uh, you know, in, in my brain. Andy, you know that it's 1955 that I'm looking yeah. up. I don't know the exact date. But I, I don't know. I've been shit like. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But if, but if you look at at Rod, you know, getting out of the war in '45. And Patterns airs in 55, you know, a, a nice round 10 years. And all of a sudden, Patterns is this moment of, oh, you know, overnight success, you know, overnight success. Yeah, the overnight success took 10 years. 
the overnight success took 10 years. It was a 10 year process of getting out of the war, going to college, deciding to become a writer, going through Cincinnati, writing all those scripts. And it was a lot of work that went into Patterns. I think everybody kind of thinks Patterns came out of nowhere and all of a sudden it established him as a writer. It did not come out of nowhere. It came out of a lot of years of hard work and recognizing that this new medium had possibilities. Now, keep in mind also that from the time that Mark just talked about in 1955 to the time he died, it was only 20 years. I mean, this man was like a comet on the uh, public media scene. And the fact that we are talking so long for now 40 years after his death about his great accomplishments, those all came within a 20-year period. Not only a 20-year period, but he manages, you know, the great line of, you know, there are no second acts in American lives. He manages three acts in those 20 years. Uh, he, he actually, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Go ahead, go ahead. He actually wrote about 252 scripts uh, until 1975. Uh, including 92 for The Twilight Zone alone. Right. Uh, out of 156, yeah, he wrote 92 of the episodes. Um, with now, Pat patterns, oh, with patterns they had, he had not anticipated, you know, that it would get this success. And the story is that uh, my mother was pregnant with me at the time, and they left uh, my sister with a babysitter. And they said, don't worry, nobody's going to call. Um, and my dad's story was that, you know, once it aired, the phone never stopped ringing. So, but, but he was stunned. And it should be just for people to know, Patterns was basically the story of uh, uh, a rise in a corporation of a young fellow who's asked to do some unethical things. And I, I, I think he refuses to do them and, and the, the ethical compromises he makes. So it's, it's one of those things that I think put people off because most of these shows were, you know, uh, the the so-and-so company, the the Chrysler Company Playhouse 90 or whatever it was. And so... so it's almost like it was uh, an attack of, uh, against the very kinds of uh, entities that were subsidizing the medium. So that that in itself is pretty ballsy. In this case, it was Kraft that uh, was the uh, the sponsoring company, and it also hit home because the central character in Patterns realizes very quickly that he has been brought in to replace an older character who has been ground to dust. Uh, by this process, yeah. and um, he, when he realizes this, he realizes he has a responsibility to himself and to his talents, and yet he has a responsibility to his fellow human beings, and this puts him in the middle of a moral dilemma, and it's extraordinarily powerful. Like I said, this is a this is a theme which you're going to see, Rod. Um, and, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons we're still talking about him. Um, Absolutely. Is, is the fact that everything that Rod seemed to write about is relevant today. Everything he, he talked about, we're dealing with today. And uh, you can, you can see, you, and that, that goes for the early dramas, te television dramas. It's not just the Twilight Zone. There's a relevance to, to what Rod wrote that speaks to us and will continue to speak to us. Um, and I, I, I've said this before, but there are certain writers who, who you read their writing and it dates. Yeah. You try to read a writer from the mid 1800s. You try to read Emerson. Anybody try to read Emerson lately? Yeah. You know, it's hard to relate to some writers from from that period. Yeah. But there are certain writers whose writers whose writing seems as fresh as the day it was written. And it seems to continue to speak to generation after generation after generation. And that's one of the reasons we're still talking about Rod Serling. And I, th I think just, the, just to follow up on that, you know, people, I've always tell young kids are in a golden age where they can get all the writings free on something like Project Gutenberg. And I think Rod Serling falls into that American category of writer. Uh, you mentioned Mark Twain. I, I would put him in the same kind of category of an Ambrose Bierce. I would put him in the category of someone like uh, Stephen Crane as well. People who wrote about very uh, specific things that are, are human and, and not always what the society at the time wanted to, to really look at clearly. And yet those are the, the writers that, that don't date, I think. You know, it's the writers who are writing just sort of around the edge, the little pop cultural uh, nuances that 20 years from now you're like, oh, they're the ones that don't last. But 
there was about a year and a half period between Patterns, which was the first big success, and then the other really sort of towering success of Requiem for Heavyweight. And I, I, I read, uh, I remember about a year or so ago, uh, probably maybe about once a month or even uh, more often, uh, uh, a Rod Serling teleplay was uh, being aired. And it seemed that the critics always wanted Patterns to be you know, redone. And uh, so talk a little bit about some of, if, if you can, uh, some of those uh, plays in between Patterns and Requiem for a Heavyweight and uh, the frustration that uh, uh, Rod Serling might have felt. Well, I don't know if it was frustration because he was successful after that point. And as Mark uh, very correctly points out, he was on the map as soon as, uh, as soon as Patterns came out. Requiem for a Heavyweight which was the second production of the uh, celebrated Playhouse 90, was the same kind of story. It was about somebody who has been used up and, uh, and aged out, and yet it was based about simple, basic humanity, and these are, and morality, and these are, uh, these are themes which Rod stayed with throughout his career. Uh, other plays that he did around that time, uh, The Rack, which took place uh, in a courtroom, essentially, about someone who was accused of collaborating with uh, the North Koreans during the war, was equally uh, morally uh, sharp. And uh, so he had already achieved by this point, or would soon, the title of angry young man. And uh, he was both young and angry, and he always had a moral point of view, which uh, he was not shy about sharing. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm dead on, on the rack. I, I, I have to, I, everything he wrote between patterns and requiem for a heavyweight. The, the critics were looking for another patterns. That's and true. The thing that he kept hearing and he got very frustrated with was was when they would say, "Well, this is good, but it's not up to patterns. It's not up to patterns." And it's like, well, you know, that that does become the 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 frustration. Um, it's, it's, it speaks to the importance of Requiem for Heavyweight. I think Requiem for Heavyweight proved to himself and to everybody else, for that matter, that he wasn't a one-hit wonder. Yeah. That, you know, it's the one-two punch of his guy. It's keeping with the boxing theme of, of Requiem. And uh, Requiem unquestionably is the payoff punch that follows patterns. But Rod was very proud of the rack, and he had every right to be proud of the rack. Uh, if you go back and you look at that and read that script, you realize that what he's doing is he is examining the side of the person who informed because he was tortured. Now think about the relevance of that particular subject today. Yeah. He was getting into a very, very difficult subject for the mid-1950s. He also stays true to the military point of view in this. This is not an attack on the military in any way, shape, or form. He manages to walk the line of making you understand both the side of the person who was tortured and fearful and informs and the side of the person who has to prosecute him. One of the That's things he did during so. one of the things that Rod did during this time was explore these kind of issues where there was no good solution. Right. So what you what becomes moral is taking the least bad solution. Um, Mark is very familiar with another teleplay he did during that time called The Strike, which, uh, in which a, uh, uh, a major during the war has to call in an airstrike on his own men who are no longer in communication. And it's something he absolutely does not want to do because he knows these men are going to die, but he knows he has no reasonable choice in this matter. And uh, these kind of uh, extremely difficult moral choices were absolutely in his head during this time. And uh, I don't know of many other writers who were, were dealing on that deep a level. Do you, Mark? No. And Dan, you mentioned before about, you know, uh, comparing him to, to Mark Twain. And I'm going to uh, basically uh, spoil part of my own introduction to the new book here. But um, there was a phrase that Mark Twain used to describe himself, which I think is a perfect description of Rod Serling, is a, a little girl in France had written Mark Twain a letter and said, you know, you're basically known as a funny person, you're basically known as this, but, you know, I, I sense that you are truly a moralist. 
And he wrote back a letter and basically saying, <laughs> <laughs> and he says, yes, I'm a moralist in disguise. And I thought, is there a better description of Rod Serling than That's that? True. A moralist in disguise. That fits his entire career. It well, is behind everything there is an intellectual grip that, 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 that he's always interested in the moral underpinnings. And that's something that a lot of writers today run away from. Yeah, a absolutely. lot of writers, like it's almost, you know, it, it, like it's it's not, it's not classy to have a moral. Or it's not classy to deal to, to overtly deal with that. Rod dealt with them, and he dealt with them head on. And I think that is one of the one of the other reasons he's he's relevant today. Rod wrote about life and death. I mean, these were these are the big issues. He didn't write about little tiny family dynamics or irony or anything like that. I mean, there was a lot of irony in the Twilight Zone, but it was irony put to a moral use. I think that was part of his frustration because he wanted to talk about these social issues and these moral issues, and the, the sponsors were striking everything, which is, the story, as the story goes, why he launched into the Twilight Zone, because he could, he could have, well, his quote was, uh, that an alien can say what a Democrat or a Republican can't. Yeah. And so he, he would still get these messages across and they would slide under the radar of the sponsors and they wouldn't know what hit them. He also said that uh, uh, a writer in television need walk tiptoe and in agony lest he offend a given serial buyer from some state below the Mason-Dixon. Uh, but before I move on to Reckman for Heavy, I just want to ask two questions. Um, was the early television uh, era that uh, Serling first came up, and was that still affected by any of the remnants of McCarthyism? And what did Rod Serling think of that and people like, say, Ilya Kazan in the business? Did he have any stands on that? I don't know that he specifically talked about Ilya Kazan, though clearly he was uh, against naming names or anything like that. But yes, he absolutely rallied, uh, railed against uh, this kind of censorship. Uh, he uh, thought censorship was appalling on television. And uh, again, to underscore what Mark has so eloquently said, uh, he considered public writing to be a um, moral value. Uh, Mark, do you have any comments on that as well? Um, and, and again, it, it's... The blacklist affected everything. It affected everything and everybody. Uh, it, 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 but Rod was, by the dint of, of where he was and when he was, um, he wasn't as affected by it. When the blacklist was in its full force, he was in New York. And the New York theater scene, you know, it was not immune to the blacklist, but it was not in the thrall of it as much as Hollywood was. So he was sort of out of the firing line a little bit of that. I'm sure, um, and, I, and I'm guessing here, but I'm sure he was appalled by it. I'm sure he was absolutely, you know, that had he been on the firing line, um, he would have taken uh, a pretty strong stance on the blacklist and the informing that went on. Um, but, I, you know, and this is the lovely thing about Rod Serling. He would have understood the people who informed. Yeah. He would have understood why they did it. He had a tremendous amount of human understanding and compassion. If Rod had written a drama about the blacklist, he would have condemned it and then made you feel sorry for the people who informed. <laughs> that's who he was. So that's absolutely true. In fact, Anne mentioned that uh, early in his uh, life he was blackballed by a Jewish fraternity for dating a, uh, a non-Jewish girl. Uh, he wrote a teleplay called In the Presence of Mine Enemies about the Warsaw Ghetto, and he was roundly criticized by liberals and Jews, both of which uh, he counted himself among, for writing a sympathetic Nazi character who actually goes and ultimately does the right thing. And uh, that's the kind of nuanced, layered understanding of the human condition that Rod continually displayed. And, and historically, in the presence of mine enemies, is interesting because it's the last Playhouse ninety. It's the very last. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Yes, and uh, the the interestingly enough, the penultimate Playhouse ninety, Horton Foot writes, and it's about Mark Twain, and oh. then it's followed by in the presence of mine enemies, 
And it's kind of symbolically the end of that era, even though the era was sort of already done. But it's 1960, the last Playhouse 90s airs in 1960, and it kind of sim and, and and the Twilight Zone's already up and running at this point. But it's kind of symbolically the end of that great era of live drama. It puts the punctuation point on it. Let me just uh, ask one final thing before we get to Requiem. Um, I know there was a Twilight Zone episode called, like, A Town Has Turned to Dust, and I know that was originally supposed to be uh, a separate teleplay. It was about uh, the Emmett Till uh, lynching, I believe, and it got so watered down that in its 30-minute version it became, I think, about the, the lynching of a Mexican back in the 1880s or something. Uh, was that in between that period, between Patterns and Requiem, that, that first came and then was rejected, or was that one of the later plays after Requiem? Well, that was the second time he had tried to uh, deal with the horrific uh, Emmett Till case, which was really the beginning, I think, of uh, 1954 of the modern civil rights movement. The first was called Noon on Doomsday, and it was the same uh, kind of thing. And Rod used to, uh, what the networks did when, when they made him change the topic, the race, the location, the time, everything, he called that ritual track covering which the networks continually try to do. And Anne is very correct that uh, one of his motivations for the Twilight Zone was being able to address these issues, in his case, directly. He actually said about that script, uh, a town is turned to dust. He said in the end, his script had turned to dust. Yeah. Um, so let's go to Requiem, because that's sort of considered for the live television era, sort of the Citizen Kane of, uh, <laughs> of that, uh, that medium. And this is basically about a, a down-and-out palooka uh, looking to turn his life around. And I got actually the Criterion Collection uh, of uh, that has about seven or eight of the, the classic episodes, and it has both Patterns and Rec Women. I, I was born in 65, so I remember it in the 1970s, uh, public television in New York City, where I grew up, did rerun some of those uh, old kinescopes, I guess they would be. Um, and I know I saw a couple of other ones that had Rod Serling's name on it, but the only two that... that seem to have survived intact are, are Rec Women patterns. That's the comedian. Oh, comedian. That, oh, that's right, yeah. That's on it too, yeah, with Mickey Rooney, yeah. Um, uh, so let's talk about Rec Women. Um, this, this is sort of his, like I said, this is uh, considered the pinnacle, if not one of the, if it's not the Everest of the live television era, it's certainly one of the two or three highest peaks. Um, how, how did that come about, uh, you know, well, Requ Requiem was about a lot of things, and uh, again, you have to keep in mind that in the 1950s, boxing was not a marginalized sport as it is now. It was a huge sport, uh, and probably next to baseball, it was the most popular sport. Uh, professional football hadn't really yet reached its ascendancy. And it should, but, be no uh, it should be noted, too, that the boxer, they wanted to become a professional wrestler, and that was the, also the first golden age of wrestling on television as well. That's true, absolutely. Uh, with people like Gorgeous George, everybody uh, remembers. And uh, Requiem is about a lot of things, but one of the things it uh, most primarily is about is dignity and human dignity. And the villains, the real villains of the piece, are the, pe are the exploiters, the ones who try to rob ordinary people of their dignity. And the heroine is a woman who comes from a completely different social class, educational background, as the hero, Mountain. Uh, and she's the one who gives Mountain McClintock his dignity. And we might also say, and uh, Mark has written about this as well, what an incredible performance Jack Palance did in the role of Mountain McClintock. And Rod, had, Rod wrote that uh, he felt that uh, Jack was really his partner in creating this role. As, as to what you just said, I, my dad said that he had one basic premise when he wrote Requiem, and that was that everyone can and must find their own dignity. I, um, the, the Twilight Zone is imprinted on my DNA and, and always will be, but Requiem for a Heavyweight is my favorite thing that your dad had ever wrote. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing piece. And, every, and, and if you look at that, the, the Playhouse 90 production, everything goes right. It is everything. The, the direction goes right. The casting goes right. It, it's this moment. And, and, and when it was about to air, they thought they had a disaster on their hands. Uh, not, 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 
a, lo a, lo a lot of that was due to the fact that Ed Wynn had such a shaky rehearsal playing uh, Army, the, uh, uh, the, the, the aide de camp in the, his cor in the corner, and the one who is the closest thing that Mountain has. Uh, boy, did he pull it together. <laughs> when the camera started to roll, Ed came through. But Keenan Wynn's performance, his son, as, as Mesh, the, the manager, it's an amazing performance. Absolutely. You know? And it would, it would it completely steal the entire thing if it weren't for the fact that Jack Palance is in this. Yeah. And, and, and Dan, you, you mentioned uh, seeing, it, uh, seeing the kinescope version. And probably of all the early teleplays, this is the one that really underscores the point that we've been trying to make. that This really was a hybrid between stage and screen because... Uh, the shots are tight, they're mostly interior, they're very dark, they're very moody, uh, and yet it has the immediacy and the electricity of, of live theater. So in, uh, in this teleplay version of Requiem, it was eventually made into a movie with a different cast, but in the teleplay version, you really get the spark of live theater, I think. Yeah, and, and that energy is missing from the movie. I, I like the movie. You know, and the movie uh, has a different ending. Yeah, uh, so as valid an ending as the as the you know it, it's it's up for grabs which ending you like you know better. Um, I don't really think it much matters. Uh, well, I, I but would... oh, go ahead, go ahead. But but uh, Mark's right. There's an energy to the Playhouse ninety that's not in the movie. The movie almost yeah. seems lethargic compared yeah. to the Playhouse ninety. I was they like, actually did a show uh, called The Man in the Funny Suit about the making of Requiem. Uh, that my father acts in, but but it goes to what you were saying, Mark, about the the, the fear they had with Ed Wynn because he had only done comedy, and how was he going to do you know this serious role? And it's really quite interesting. Yeah, yeah it's a lovely piece. <laughs> and later, Ed Wynn appears on an extremely uh, powerful Twilight Zone called One for the Angels, where he does a lot of his comedic shtick, but it's ultimately to a very serious purpose and. Uh, I think as much as any of them, it shows Rod's, uh, Rod's sense of cosmic justice and yet sentimentality at the same time. I don't shy away from calling Rod a sentimentalist, but his sentiment, his sentimentality was so genuine and so born of authentic emotion that you absolutely go with it. It's not treacly. It's not false. There's nothing, there's nothing that's not authentic about it. Well, I wanted well, to... Right. I wanted to uh, get to the the adaptations of both patterns and Requiem were made into films, and I think I think uh, I think the Requiem film is a good film, but it 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 does lack something. Anthony Quinn, as as big a name and as many good performances as he gave in film, he doesn't measure up to Palance. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think there's there's that. And the, probably the immediacy, and, and then I think it's Jackie Gleason and Mickey Rooney who are in place of the wins in the other two roles. Um, it, it's good, but you know, I, I think I, I saw on YouTube uh, Rod Serling talking about that he knew and understood television as a medium, and that and, and what you're saying about it, it being a hybrid between uh, theater and film is that what works in television and the live television era so well you know, is going to lose a little something out of the crib. Do, would you agree with that? Sure, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, however, I think, had you just seen the movie of uh, Requiem and there had never been a television play, you would have thought it was quite powerful. And uh, Jackie Gleason gives an interesting performance. Uh, it's not the same. And I think Mickey Rooney gives a terrific performance. He does. He does. I mean, Mickey Rooney is the one really outstanding element of that movie. He, you believe him as a former boxer. Yeah. He, he brings really a terrific depth of performance uh, to, to that movie. He's almost, it, sometimes to the point that you think he's in a different movie. And what's uh, interesting is when you look at Mickey Rooney's career and Andy Hardy and all of the uh, farces and spoofs he did, some of his greatest acting in the movie of Requiem for a Heavyweight, in The Comedian, in several Twilight Zone episodes, is some of the best acting Mickey Rooney ever did. Yeah, and uh, let's let's just end this segment on that note with the comedian and some of the later plays. Uh, that's also one of the uh, the teleplays that was in the Criterion Collection uh, collection that I had uh, watched uh, some time ago, and uh, that 
he really plays a real son of a bitch. Uh, he's sort of a, a Sid Caesar type character in in that. Uh, no, actually, I, he's actually a Milton Berle character. Okay. If you go back to the uh, actual history there. Okay. Well, but uh, the writers they, loved Sid Caesar. They hated Milton Berle. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, if you can, just get, give a little one or two minute synopsis of, of the impact of, of that, because I think that was quite lauded too. Not quite to the extent of Requiem of Patterns, but that sort of, I guess, maybe his third most well-known work from the, that era, uh, either Mark or Anna. Well, I, I think one of the reasons it's, it's not quite as well-known is because it was based on a, an Ernest Lehman story. It was not an original story for Rod. So, you know, he wrote this, a brilliant screenplay uh, or teleplay for this. And the performances, Mel Torme is wonderful in that, in that production. Um, but I, I think the fact that it was an adaptation it takes a little bit of the, um, you know, not the importance off of it, but, you know, you're going to look at Patterns and Requiem. Those were Rod's stories. So I think that that's one reason maybe the comedian suffers a little bit in the standing. But there's one that's right around the time, which, you know, you should talk about, which is Velvet Alley. Yes. Um, Velvet Alley is an amazing piece of work. Um, I, I, I look back at that and looked at the performances in that, He's, he's got two of Rod's favorite actors, Art Carney and Jack Klugman, in it. And, and he's essentially uh, looking at himself in the moral mirror, isn't he? Yes, he is a very brave piece of work. It's an extraordinarily, uh, you know, right out there piece of work. And the performances, it's, it's, for anybody who thinks that Art Carney, you know, and obviously he got, you know, a lot of props later on for Harry and Tonto and other things that he did. But, you know, what an incredible incredible performance by Art Carney, who at the end, who digs so deep to, to play that, that, that role. Um, you know, th that's another one that I think, you, you know, you, you can't dismiss in Rod's uh, pre-Twilight Zone work. Okay. Well, we're going to uh, end this segment and head over to talk about the Twilight Zone in just a moment, so please stay with us. All right, uh, so now the thing that Rod Serling is most known for, if you Googled, it'll come up with The Twilight Zone, or just Twilight Zone, which was an anthology uh, series on CBS from 59 to 65. And uh, I guess the I guess by 1959, Rod Serling uh, uh, was getting disillusioned with uh, corporate sponsorship and whatnot, and he gave a, a fairly famous uh, interview that you can still see in its entirety now on YouTube, to Mike Wallace of later 60 Minutes fame. Uh, then I think he was just a game show host and interviewer. But uh, it's one of the more scathing and direct uh, interviews that, that you can see because, I mean, this is, this is 1959. He's giving the interview, and he's talking uh, really bluntly in a way that people 25, 30 years would take 25, 30 years for people to, to do. Um, uh, if either Mark wants to just talk a little bit about that, that interview and how how that was a part of leading into him, uh, Rod Serling, getting the Twilight Zone off the ground. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, one of the... Uh, as we said before, Rod's first book was a collection of teleplays that included patterns and uh, requiem for heavyweight call patterns. And he wrote a rather lengthy uh, introduction to that book and then he added ongoing uh, narrative and analysis on each script. It's an amazing book uh, because of that. It's a real glimpse into the writer's mind. And one of the things you see, if you watch that, that Mike Wallace interview, one of the things you first think, like, well, you know, boy, he's being rough on the medium that made him. Boy, he's being, you know, is this, is this biting the hand that has fed him all along or something like that? But then you read those introductions and you realize, this is a man who had incredibly high standards, and he applied those standards to himself. How you read those introductions, he's talking about patterns and reckoning for heavyweight, and he's dissecting those, those, those pieces, where he went wrong, what he did right. He's brutally honest, sometimes I think too brutal on himself in those introductions where you want to go, Rod, 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 no, no, you know, uh, this is better than that, no. And, um, you, so, so when he gets to that interview, 
this is who he was. This was not just lashing out at the, the medium. Um, this was a guy who was, was, was honestly appraising where the medium was at that point and realizing he had nowhere else to go but through that signpost up ahead, the door that leads to imagination. He had to go through that door in order to remain viable and to say the things he wanted to say. And uh, the, the great moment of that interview is when Mike Wallace looks at him and says, so you've given up on writing anything important now. Yeah. It was like, good one, Mike. Nice, nice piece of prediction there. Because the, the thing that he writes that's not important from here on in is perhaps the most important thing he did with his writing career. I and that's no question. There's no question that that series completely influenced our entire generation. Uh, it has become part of our soul. Anne, go ahead. From, from what I understand about that interview is that Twilight Zone was about to be launched, and he was very apprehensive that you know the sponsors were going to get an idea of what he was doing in terms of serious television, and again getting these important issues across. So that that I think is why he answered that. He sort of faltered when Mike Wallace said that, you know, so you're not going to write anything serious anymore. And then he said, well, yeah, no, yes. And... Well, let's... Well, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Let me add one other thing to that, which is, I think uh, some of the, that interview has come down to people thinking, and the move into the Twilight Zone has led a lot of people to thinking, ah, Rod sort of conveniently moved towards the fantasy world as a way of getting these messages across which is not quite true. Rod was always interested in the fantasy world. He read deeply on writers like Edgar Allan Poe and Lovecraft and, and, and Bierce and other writers. He knew these writers, he loved these writers. He was following his passion when he went, moved into the Twilight Zone. This wasn't a move of convenience. This was not some kind of cynical, manipulative move. He was embracing a part of who he was. And I think that's one thing we tend to forget, is that the Rod who wrote about Requiem for a Heavyweight, who wrote about boxers, the Rod who wrote about the American corporate system and patterns, the Rod who wrote about his war influences, is that, that's a part of who Rod was too, was he was very deeply interested in that form of storytelling. Absolutely, and the way he became our mentor and uh, ideal, that's how Norman Corwin was to him. People like Norman Corwin, Arch Obler, they were his heroes. Was uh, The Twilight Zone in any way influenced by the slightly earlier series, One Step Beyond? Uh, did, did that give Serling his idea for, oh, I can, I can do an anthology series, these little playlets, uh, but not just have it be... Because One Step Beyond was a very good show. It had some really good episodes. But there wasn't a deeper subtext. It was sort sort of like you know, there's a there's a monster uh, he, this week. There's a, a ghost next week. Uh, is it real or not? It was more sort of like Ripley's Believe It or Not. Whereas the Twilight Zone had deeper undertones. But was what? But did the Serling ha was he influenced by One Step Beyond? He was influenced by what was going on at the time. Movies like Forbidden Planet and all that. Um, and, you know, these were fairly common, uh, particularly the, the kind of B science fiction movies in those days. But the Twilight Zone sprang whole from his consciousness. I mean, this was his take. Uh, as Mark said, he'd always been interested in science fiction, particularly people like Lovecraft. And uh, but this, uh, this sprang whole from his consciousness and it just naturally uh, evolved the way it did because of the way he felt about things. Yeah, and, you know... Uh People talk about Kafka-esque uh, approaches uh, in writing. The Twilight Zone especially became famous for sort of the Schillingian uh, twist ending, uh, the moral at the end. Sort of, uh, I actually did a poem years ago called Aesop in a Modern Box about Rod Serling. He, the, he had that sort of Aesopian kind of uh, 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 more, more, uh, moral at the end of each uh, little episode. So let's well, what, we, what we say, Dan, is that... Uh, what O. Henry did for the short story, Serling did for the 30-minute teleplay. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about some of the, the first, the more influential, or the, the, the ones, that some of the episodes that have garnered the most fame or are, are most recognized for certain things. And then we'll talk about some of the ones that you all think are, are the best. So what are, if, if there are four or five out of the however many 200-plus episodes that aired, 
Um, which are which are the ones that generally that television critics and historians look back on as the most important? Well, you're going to get the same answer from all three of us. And I uh, I remember asking Rod one once which is the one that people reacted to the most. And by far, far and away above all others, it was uh, uh, in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, the, the gargoyle uh, people. Yes, and uh, that I don't know that that's necessarily the best one. We all have our own. Uh, we all have our own favorites. But that was the one that the viewers reacted to the most, and that and Rod was very aware of that. And that was very uh, a very uh, brutal critique of fascism. It was a group, brutal cr critique of of fascism, of everybody wanting to be the same, of the uh, the button down society of the nineteen fifties uh, going into the nineteen sixties. Uh, the man in the gray flannel suit, all of that. Yeah. Uh, Mark, the, uh, what, what other episode or two can you... Uh, you know, I, I, this, is, this is going to, to sound like heresy, and it also is uh, uh, going to uh, give away uh, at least a chapter of the new book, but okay, here we go. Um, one episode that everybody loves is, is, is uh, the, the very, very first one with Burgess Meredith. And uh, you know he he the the, the, the nuclear the, bomb falls and the book is, yes right the, the 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 man who 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 breaks his glasses at the end when he you know, last has time to read. I really don't like that episode. It's the one that everybody goes to. It's the one that everybody oh the guy with the glasses and he breaks his glasses and it's you know and, and it, 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 it it's symbolically and I always thought you know people who take it in the shorts in the Twilight Zone usually deserve it. This poor guy didn't deserve it. I think it's an awful message. You know, it's, it's, it's like, the only one where Rod was morally me. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying, but but again, it's a, I remember sitting around uh, having uh, uh, dinner with 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 David Bean Cooley, who's a TV critic and one of my best friends, and Harlan Ellison and his wife, and Charles Edward Pogue, a very fine screenwriter, and his wife, and the six of us were sitting around in uh, uh, Studio City having dinner. And we got to talking about the Twilight Zone, which we all adore. And everybody started going like, oh, the glasses, the glasses, the broken glasses. And I said, can I say something here? <laughs> and, 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 and as soon as I said it, I said, they all looked at me and said, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. I said, you know, we, we live in an era where, you know, reading is under fire, you know. It, but yet, iconically, it's up there with Eye of the Beholder, that if you said somebody... What images do you remember from the Twilight Zone? And that is the power of the image, because the image of the broken glasses and the heartbreak of that moment is so strong and so powerful that it remains one of the great images from the Twilight Zone. Although, look, Mark, let me give you, let's, let me give you an, an alternative reading. Different interpretation. Because, because there, that's the other great thing about the Twilight Zone. It, uh, like Shakespeare, not quite the same as Shakespeare, but like Shakespeare, it, it, it releases all, many, many meanings each each episode. So I would say one of the things Rod maybe have been getting at was if you are so self-involved, if you are so insular, so uninvolved with other people, there's going to be a reckoning for that. And uh, when uh, when all the other people who he didn't care about are destroyed, okay, well, you know, you can't relax and you can't enjoy yourself after that. Another episode, which I don't recall the name of, but it's very famous, about uh, uh, Bill Muby is in it, and he's the uh, kid with tele telekinetic uh, powers. It's a good and life. What, a good life, okay. Yeah, life. Um, and what, what that's about on its surface is a kid who can uh, do things, uh, bad things to other people, and if you displease him, uh, he, that's what he does. He'll send you out to the cornfield and things like that. But on a deeper level, what that episode, you could say, is really about is the consequences of bad parenting. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's a kind of a profound statement. Another, another episode that's probably very famous is the, the Damon Knight episode, To Serve Man. That's, I think, along with uh, a, a handful of others, you know, the, the, the aliens come down and, uh, yeah, the, we're going we're gonna to rescue mankind. And that was a very big theme in like, like 1950s ufology. They had all of these cults springing up with uh, saviors from Venus and whatnot, but they turned out to be a cookbook. And how about you? Uh, uh, what, what are the episodes that to you uh, are the touchstone ones, whether it's for their quality or in any personal relationship with your father? 
Um, well, there are several. Certainly walking distance. You know, the, the, the ones that deal with going back in time, nostalgic things, I love. So walking distance, a stop at Willoughby. Uh, interesting, the, the one you mentioned, um, time enough at last, when I do presentations, that's one that people always mention. I agree with you, Mark Dewitziak, that it's, it was brutal. Uh, and and, and you, have to, you have to talk about in praise of Pip and your yes. personal connection to it. Right. I, I didn't watch many of the Twilight Zones, actually, while my dad was still alive. And I didn't until after he died. And it, and it was more to see my dad than, than to watch the actual show. And one of the first ones that I watched after he died was called In Praise of Pip with the wonderful Jack Klugman. And I realized watching this episode that my dad used a routine that he and I did. Who's your best buddy, Pop? You are Pip. You are Dad. And, and my dad, one of my nicknames was Pops. So uh, this was a pretty poignant moment watching this and, and, and literally finding my dad in the Twilight Zone. Yeah, the phrase of Pip, that's, I think, the best of the four or five Klugman episodes. Everyone goes for the Gabriel's Trumpet one, which is a good episode. But I, and that's one of the first episodes on television, I think, to deal with the Vietnam War. It was the first. It was? Okay. Um, I know uh, off the top of my head two episodes that are probably not well known. I was just looking up online. That, that have always stuck with me is, one, because of its influence, uh, there, there was an episode called The Hitchhiker, in which uh, a fellow uh, keeps reappearing to a woman as she's driving across country. And the reason it's so influential is, uh, I think that Ed, uh, I think that was the first season, 1959. Three years later, there's a low-budget film called Carnival of Souls made by Herc Harvey about a woman who's driving across country, and there's a guy who keeps appearing on the, the side of the road. It, it it's basically a precursor to to the the George Romero zombie type movies, but it's interesting because because everything in Carnival of Souls was an expansion upon the Hitchhiker episode, and I don't know. Let's see, did did Rod write that one? Uh, no, it was a radio show. It was it was it yeah. was a radio a drama that had been done originally, and he yeah. had bought the story. Lucille Fletcher, uh, I'm seeing as the writer, the Fletcher. original writer. Um, and uh, Lucy. Yeah, but it's just interesting how influential that was. And the second one that, that, that has stuck with me that probably very few people know, and I, off the top of my head I don't know the name of, is the episode where a young girl's out riding her horse and a screaming woman comes on a horse chasing her. Stop, Spur stop, of the stop. Mm -hmm. Which one is it? Called, it's called Spur of the Moment. Yeah. It's a fifth season episode. Yeah, and it basically it turns out that the older woman is, is a version of the young girl 25, 30 years later who makes the wrong choice. And throughout the episode, you think you're, you're, you're rooting for her to go for the handsome guy, the, the, the Hollywood, all-American, uh, good-looking guy who's going to be her Romeo, her, her, her savior. She chooses him in the end, and then you, you see that she made the wrong choice. And I think the thing that sticks with me is, is I could write several books on how I think Hollywood's ideal of this sort of juvenile Romeo and Juliet love rather than deeper forms of love has, has really screwed up so many people. And this is one of the few few things on television or film that, that, that shows that, that people, you know, it's, it's great to feel love, but sometimes you have to use your head as well. And it, it's so 180 degrees from how, how modern society, even to this day, views love. Uh, and I, I think that's really a very underrated episode uh, myself. Um, well, I'm actually, that, you, you've actually just articulated something I'm writing about that episode because I couldn't agree more. Yeah. If there was one Shakespeare I would go in and rip out, it would be Romeo and Juliet. Basically right. because it has propagated the myth that love, young love is never wrong. Right. And statistically, we can prove young love is almost always wrong. Yeah. The younger the marriage, the quicker the, the failure of the marriage. Is that Enduring marriages are based on mutual sense of humor, mutual uh, belief systems, mutual uh, you know, ways of viewing the world, and... You know, all you have to do is to see any episode of uh, the Oprah Winfrey show where the, you know, they, they, they have a marriage counselor on there and the parents and the two teenagers want to run off. And the marriage counselor says, well, you don't know what you're up against. You don't know. This. Every says, you know, state statistics, everything. The parents say, wait, wait, wait. And then somebody in the audience stands up and says, but they're in love. Yeah. And the whole audience turns as one is like a lynch mob. And yes, they're in love. You see this in Titanic. You see this 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 mythology being, you know, and, and the other one is opposites attract. And and I think you're right, Rod. 
was, was writing a more mature uh, look at this as saying, you know, when you make those kinds of, it, the, the, the name of the episode is spur of the moment. Yeah, right. It's a play on words because she's on a horse and she's riding a horse. Yeah. Let me just, but uh, it's a spur of the moment decision. Let me just ask something, and maybe Anne knows this. Um, everyone knows the famous Twilight Zone theme. Do, 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 do. But the first season didn't have that theme. And I always thought that's a much scarier, it's a much more mysterious uh, theme song. Uh, and I think the introduction, uh, the spoken introduction by Rod Serling uh, is the best, most, it's the longest of the introductions. Why, why was that changed after the first uh, season? Do you know, uh, the, or do either the Marks know why they dropped that? Uh, I don't know. No? I don't know. Oh, okay. But let's go, let's go on. Uh, well, I know they, they changed the opening, they, they, they changed the opening season to season, and they changed yeah. the introduction season to season. Okay. And, That's true. And in, the, and in the first season, if I recall, uh, Rod is not seen at the beginning. He's only no. heard. That's right. He's not on camera until the second season, and his first real appearance on camera is in the last episode of the first season, A World of His Own, which Richard Matheson wrote, and Keenan Wynn is in playing a writer who can talk things into existence. Oh, yeah, that, that's also a good one, yeah. Dan, I think one of the most important episodes, uh, and I know, I know Anne agrees with me, is one uh, completely without humor uh, called Death's Head Revisited. And it's about a former Nazi SS officer yeah, yeah. goes back to Dachau to uh, reminisce, essentially. And what's wonderful about it is it showed what the Twilight Zone could do at its greatest and deepest, which was create a cosmic sense of justice, which was not available in real life. Uh, in this episode, uh, this uh, Ubergruppenführer is uh, confronted by the ghosts of the prisoners he's killed, and they put him on trial, and they sentence him to permanent insanity, which is an absolutely wonderful and, and fitting punishment. And what's interesting about that one is almost every other episode, the closing uh, commentary ended with, in the Twilight Zone, or the pity is that this is not just confined to the Twilight Zone. In this case, Rod knew this was important enough. He didn't end it that way. He ended it something to that. And this is true not only in the Twilight Zone, but wherever men walk God's green earth. And it is striking for its exceptionalism in that way. Yeah. Uh, my, you know, my personal, uh, or one of my personal, I, I, it's hard to pick a, a favorite Twilight Zone sure. episode, or, you know, because it, it ranges so much. Uh, but my one of my favorite scripts by Rod uh, was one, and my, my favorite one, because if there are two actors who are most associated with The Twilight Zone, they're Jack Klugman and Burgess Meredith, because each did four star turns during the five season run of The Twilight Zone. And my favorite Burgess Meredith uh, one is not time enough at last. It's an episode called The Obsolete Man. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's in a powerful, it, it captures a lot of Rod's themes, uh, the value of the individual, the value of the written word, the the, the, the dangers of a totalitarian society. And it's about a man that Burgess Meredith plays who identifies himself as a librarian and the state has ruled him obsolete. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's, I think, it's the most Orwellian piece, wouldn't you say, Mark? It is. And, it, and it's one of those that, it, it, the way it's staged, it's almost staged like an avant-garde piece of theater. You could almost see it staged. You know, like a lot of Rod's pieces, you can see it actually, you can see how to stage it. You can see it, how, to, how to do this in a small, intimate theater. And it's, but it's one of my favorite pieces because it speaks to the value of the written word as well, which is something which is, you know, increasingly under fire uh, in our culture. And I think that's an extraordinarily powerful and relevant episode. And, um, you know, and speaking to, uh, you're talking about The Hitchhiker. Going back to something Mark said, that Rod wrote about life and death themes, it's interesting how many times death shows up as a character in Rod's work. Um, in, uh, one for the Angels, the one with Ed Wynn. Yeah. Death is a character. Murray Hamilton, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it's Murray Hamilton. Yeah. It, 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 and then Robert Redford. Yes, and Robert Redford. And, yeah, he's, he's a, death is a constant character. Uh, throughout this, as if to say, you know, that, that Rod, I think, understood we're all only here for a short time. Death is here. He's, you know, he's right out of view. And he is always kind of there. 
And we have to deal with that. We have to interact with that. And I think, you know, and, and Anne can speak to this much more insightfully and eloquently than I can. But um, I think maybe perhaps because his own father did die so young, he understood that, you know, there's a point in your life when you understand that death is something you have to cope with. And in we're going to get into it. You there's know. one introduction. I don't remember which one it is, Mark. Maybe you do, where he actually says, every man is put on earth condemned to die. Time and method of execution unknown. Right. And I, I can't remember which episode it is either, but I, but I do remember that as you're saying it. Yeah. And, and I think he, he innately understood that. You know, and I don't even think that that so much came from the war as it came from the, that, that moment when he realizes he cannot go to his own father's funeral. Right. Uh, and, never, and never had the necessary closure. Right. So, so it, haunted, you know, it haunted him throughout his life, for, for certainly. I want to talk about a, one other episode because I think a lot of people uh, sometimes have uh, thought of uh, uh, The Twilight Zone as being just uh, these morality plays, but there was a lot of leeway in terms of uh, uh, structure. And the... the the episode that sticks the most in my mind is the Luigi Pirandello-esque uh, Five Characters in Search of an Exit. <coughs> Excuse me, where you just have these five uh, absurd characters. I think it's a, a, a cheerleader, maybe, a, a clown. A, a ballerina. A, a yeah, ballerina. Oh, yeah. a ball, ballerina, a, a major in the Air Force, a clown, uh, a cowboy, and uh, someone else. Uh, I think it's a hobo. A hobo, and, that's right, yeah. And... Uh, for the for the whole show, they're they're stuck in a place. It looks like it's a, a spaceship or something. It, it could be something out of a forbidden planet. And up above them, that looks like they're going towards some kind of a star or, or something. And they're trying to get out of this uh, this prison. Uh, and in the end, you know, it just turns out that they're dolls in a sort of Salvation Army uh, waste bin. And uh, the interesting thing is is how deeply that gets into existential crises. Not just, not just I mean, we talk about Rod Serling uh, as a moralist. Uh, you can talk about pro or con, but existentialism is even deeper, I think. It gets to the heart of existence, and that's, that's the episode, and there are a few others if I look through. Uh, uh, You're absolutely right, Dan. This is totally existentialist, as are an episode where, I believe, is it uh, Inger Stevens is a robot, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. On on the, the asteroid, yeah. There is a there there is an episode of the hour long where George Grizzard is a robot. Uh, he goes to this Pinocchio theme over and over again of people of of what does self actualization mean? You know, what does it mean to be real? What does it mean to be human? And is there a distinction between being that and not being that? Yeah. You know, I, I would also point out that uh, as we're talking about the Twilight Zone. One of the things that Rod deserves a lot of credit for is uh, we, we know he wrote the overwhelming number of uh, Twilight Zone, but he gathered around him a group of writers, you know, and Rod was the, you know, the, the, the keeper of the Twilight Zone, if you will. He, you know, he staked out the territory, he owned it, he was the proprietor, but he then had this group of writers that he brought in who understood the Twilight Zone and contributed mightily and you know probably the three writers you know second to rod were richard matheson charles beaumont and george clayton johnson and a lot of the episodes that people remember uh, one of those wrote 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 some some of those episodes as well um you have uh and these were good friends of rods as I mean, well I mean, at twenty thousand feet everybody remembers I mean, I think the gremlin on the wing if you yeah. say if you, that's right up there with the glasses and the eye of the beholder, and those moments, the gremlin on the wing, the wonderful William Shatner performance, and that's, you know, Richard Matheson's, uh, the invaders, the one with the old woman out, and her home is being invaded by these little yeah. beings, and the payoff is that they're humans yeah. visiting another planet, another Richard Matheson story. Uh, so you had these contributors to the Twilight Zone who felt like they had a, the same freedom that Rod had found to use metaphoric storytelling to get these great points across about the human condition. Uh, they had that freedom because of Rod Serling. And each and every one of them, if you would talk to them, I got very close with Richard Matheson uh, from 1990 on and ended up editing th three uh, volumes of Richard's work. And we talked about Rod all the time. And the influence of that, 
was was immense. The ability to have this kind of storytelling freedom, and knowing that Rod was carrying the major load. You know, you look at how many episodes did did Richard end up writing? It's about fifteen or sixteen episodes. You know, it's a drop in the bucket. You know. Uh, so and Beaumont didn't, you know, he, he, compared to Rod, didn't write that much. And George Clayton Johnson, his the, the level of his writing was very high. His, you know, he wrote uh, "Kick the Can," um, he wrote "A Game of I think Pool." He did about six or seven winners. Yes, he didn't write that many, but the ones he wrote were 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 very high quality episodes. And Earl Hamner wrote a couple, I think. The, Earl the Hamner, you know, I, I would not argue that the Twilight Zone was perfect for Earl Hamner. He wrote a couple of really terrific episodes. Jess Bell, for one of the few hours that really hold up very, very well. Um, you know, he and he had, he had, he had also worked at, in Cincinnati. He had also worked at, at Cut His Teeth, working at a station in Ohio. But um, you could see, you know, Earl working towards the Waltons and the things in the homecoming and the, the things that really suit his, his writing talents. Um, but, you know, he's an important contributor to The Twilight Zone as well. Earl, Earl Hamner worked at the radio station and had the job before my father got it. And my father would introduce Earl Hamner as the man who gave him his first job. Just a little, uh, a minute or two about the expansion of the show to an hour and then back for the final season to a half hour. I, I'm looking up, it came in uh, as a mid-season replacement in its fourth year. Uh, and I know, having watched, I think it's generally agreed that the hour format is probably the, the least successful of the five seasons. Would you agree? Yeah, I think Bob agreed to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, was it just a, a matter of fact that they tried to stretch a uh, half hour material out, or was it just they were running out of steam by season four? That was I, part of it, and Ron also didn't feel that the twist endings worked as well after you built it up for that long a period. Uh -huh. and, and I think it's a matter of structure. You know, uh, yeah. water finds its own level, storytelling finds its own length. Um, the Twilight Zone was naturally a half hour show. That was the vibe they wrote for. That was the, the whole. And so you look at these hours, not to say there are not hours that don't hold up. Uh, take a look on Thursday, we leave for home and that tour yeah. to force James Whitmore performance uh, in, in the middle of that. There are hours that hold up very, very well. Chess Bell was, was, is an hour that holds up extremely well. To justify the length. Hours seem padded. Yeah. Um, and that often happens with shows which play outside of their comfort zone. And I think the Twilight Zone has spent three years telling half-hour stories. And then all of a sudden they said, okay, shift. And it's like, you know, okay, you train for the 50-yard the, the, the dash, and then all of a sudden they say, okay, uh, now let's double the length and run that length. Well, that's different for training. Sure. You have to train differently for that. You have well, to, you I know. told a funny story that, uh, that really speaks to this, how television puts its own special demands, not exactly related to what Mark was saying, but he said, all right, you come in and you pitch a story about a uh, prince in Denmark whose father has just died, his wife has... Uh, he said his wife has just married the uncle who he doesn't like, who he suspects of murder. Uh, he's being forced away from his girlfriend, who is the uh, who is the daughter of the prime minister, and on and on and on. And he says, and he after he describes Hamlet, as it is, and he said, "Okay, now give me twenty six weeks of that." Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's what television does. The Twilight Zone's great advantage was that it could reinvent the wheel every week. Right. Uh, television likes recurring characters. And by the way, what this is, also speaks to the success of The Twilight Zone is television is a character-driven medium. And yes. it loves, you know, the, the, the old saying about television is uh, familiarity breeds content. Uh, that the, the audience likes formula that gets repeated week after week. And they become comfortable with the characters going through the same track every week. The Twilight Zone did not have recurring characters, but it did. It had Rod Serling. That's right. It, had, it did have a recurring character. It had somebody that people felt they knew, even though, as Ann will tell you, Rod didn't really talk like that at home. He wasn't the, uh, the submitted for your approval guy. He That wasn't the guy who, off camera, but people felt like they knew him, and they felt invested in that relationship. So that's the important thing. When you sort of say, like, well, what did the, the Twilight Zone have that other anthologies didn't have? 
On so many levels, that answer comes back to it had Rod Serling. It had Rod Serling behind the camera as a producer. It had Rod Serling as its principal writer. And it had Rod Serling as the person making the connection with the audience. And, you know, um, the only other anthology show that sort of had that was Alfred Hitchcock, uh, was the fact that Hitchcock himself introduced the stories and people look forward to the playful things that he used to do around it. And people felt that they knew Hitchcock the way they knew Serling. So that's, an, you know, that's something you can't underestimate, the fact that when Rod went on camera, it not only took him up at several levels as a, as a celebrity and as a writer, um, because let's face it, as we were saying before, how many people recognize writers? You know, can the average American pick, you know, Herman Melville out of a lineup? Do they have any shot at it? You know, well, no. You know, there's the, but if you showed them iconically a picture of Mark Twain and said, who is this? They'd have a pretty decent shot at saying, well, even if they've never read Mark Twain, saying it's Mark Twain, you know. And even people who maybe have never even seen a, an episode of The Twilight Zone will probably say, that's Rod Serling. You know, that's amazing. You can't, you, don't skip by that real fast. Stop and think about the importance of that. You know, even really well-known writers like Norman Mailer. If you stood in the middle of any mall in America and stopped the first 10 people and said, who is this? Most people probably wouldn't get it's Mailer. And Mailer was one of the most recognized writers. Absolutely true. So, but Rod Serling, they've got a really good shot at recognizing who Rod Serling is. Let me, uh, let, let that's me, amazing. Let me go back, talk a little bit about some of the contributors and how they connected with Serling. Because you mentioned Earl Hamm had worked in Cincinnati, and this is for any of the three of you. Um, were most of the directors, most of the writers, the co-collaborators on The Twilight Zone, were these people that Serling had worked with beforehand, or were they people just from the network? Mark, that's yours. Well, the case in the case of Matheson and Beaumont, no. Um, the, the Twilight Zone was the, the connection. Rod needed writers who could write in the fantasy world. Um, he needed people who were specialists in a way. Um, and so Matheson and Beaumont, who were best friends, by the way, uh, you know, R Richard and Chuck uh, had been best friends throughout the 50s. They were sort of stalking horses for each other. One would get a short story published. The other would get a short story published. One would get a novel published. The other would get a novel published. Their families were very close. Um, so the fact that these two writers <clears throat> became the first two principal writers um, after Rod um, was, was, was highly significant. Uh, so they were specialists. They had not written much for live television. They had been writing basically for the magazines, like amazing stories and fantastic stories and things like that, and publishing books. So when they showed up, and Richard had already written I Am Legend, which is, you know, you talk about leading to George Romero and The Walking Dead. I Am Legend is, is the direct link. Yeah. And The so, Shrinking Man, I think, he'd already written at that point. It, 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 yeah, he had written Shrinking Man and, and I Am Legend. So... You know, when he shows up in 1959, you know, he's checking in as one of the principal fantasy writers on the scene at that moment. But Dan, you so, also brought up something very important, which is that when you said, who are the directors? Well, we can tell you who the directors are, but it's not that important. And the reason it's not that important is, unlike the movies, where you can tell who directed every film, and you probably can't tell many, many of the writers, television was and is to this day a writer's medium. It's the writer who's important. The showrunner is never a director, it's always a writer. Uh, and The Twilight Zone was a perfect example of this. Rod had very little interest in the directing and the uh, show elements uh, and the producing, even though he was listed as the executive producer. This was a writer's medium and this is where writers shine. Yeah. Now I want to just end up this segment and then in the next segment we'll talk uh, a bit more about the post uh, Twilight Zone. We'll talk some about Anne's book. Um, but I did want to end with a little trivia question and this is for people. I act, uh, I was looking at some of the directors that had directed Twilight Zone and there, there are people like Richard Donner, Don Siegel, Joseph Newman, Jacques Tenure. Um, but I actually met one of the Twilight Zone directors when I was a child. When I was five years old and I, I want to throw this out to see if you can guess who it is. And I, for those people listening, I did not talk about this beforehand with, with any of the three experts here. But I was five years old. I grew up on the Brooklyn-Queens border. 
not too far from where Sp uh, Spike Lee directed uh, Do the Right Thing. Um, in those days, it was a very rundown area. Uh, it were a lot of uh, sex shops, pornography, a lot of mafia influence. If you ever saw Goodfellas, uh, the the character played by uh, Ray Liotta, I was one of those types of kids there. And one of, one of the days, I I was I was bringing uh, some food for some guy who sent me down to the deli, and you'd get fifty cents to to do the little errand. And I came back, and they were shooting what was then known as a stag film. This was the pre Deep Throat days, and I was introduced to the guy who's directing this stag or blue film. And he had a lot of memorabilia around, photographs of, of big stars. One of them was, uh, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll tell you who they were. I, I, I wanted to know, did, uh, the reason I asked if Rod Serling knew anything about people's background, because one of the directors of The Twilight Zone was in the 1950s under a, a pseudonym, a very well-known stag or blue film director. And I don't know if Rod Serling knew this, but do any of you have any idea of which director I'm talking about? I don't. I know. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. He had photos of him with people he'd worked with, like Jim Brown, David Jansen, who was then a huge star coming off The Fugitive. Does, okay, well, his name was Buzz Kulik, and I didn't know anything about, uh, about that uh, beforehand, but he had apparently been doing them for 15, 20 years beforehand, and uh, this was, I guess, and I looked up uh, in, in preparation for the show, apparently he had had a few flops on you know uh, in the late '60s with with uh, big films, and then about a year later he did directed Brian's Song, which is one of the seminal uh, uh, you know mm -hmm. television films of the early '70s about the death of a an NFL player. And uh, Brian Piccolo, yeah, Br Brian Piccolo, right? Uh, and uh, I think I think that was maybe the thing that made Billy D. Williams a star. Um, it was, yeah. And uh, so I, I I was just I was just wondering because. If anyone list, uh, listening to this, it's one of those little little bits of trivia that I I didn't know the name until years later, and I'm thinking I remember that's the guy from the Fugitive. And when I I looked it up and I saw saw the name, this was a couple of years ago. I said that's the guy who was no, and he didn't go. I I I won't I won't out his uh, his uh, uh, name uh, in in the business. And I don't know if films from that era even survive, but uh, it, it was just interesting. But um, uh, I, Rod would have loved that. I yeah. think the one thing. I, you know, we haven't talked about. It. He had an incredible sense of humor. He was a personally, he was a very funny man. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I also get the feeling he was not judgmental in that way. Yeah, you know, you know, he, I think he, he from from what the rod I sense, he would have been judgmental of people who hurt other people. Yeah. Exactly. You know? Yeah, he would have been Aunt judgmental has, of Aunt people. And has a who, photograph of him with a lampshade over her, his yeah. head. Really. <laughs> Uh, well, let's end this segment. Like I said, when we get back, I want to talk about the post-Twilight Zone until Rod Serling's death, and uh, we'll also talk about Anne's book and also the Rod Serling books, uh, and we'll do that in a moment. 